Uh, actually, my presentation is going to be very complementary to uh, Nia Shaviv's. Uh, I have divided it into three parts. The first part is going to be a little bit different. The second and third are really going to be very complementary and actually using some of the things that he has been saying. The, the first part is really an observation. One of the messages that I like to convey after these five years of working on the topic is that I believe that in the general world community, there has been a breaking of the balance between the three key aspects of any research in the natural sciences, which is observation, theory. By theory, I mean physical, chemical, biological theory based on principles, and numerical modeling. I believe the three are extremely important. They all should be interacting, but they should be balanced. My view is that in the last 20 years, there has been much too much on the numerical side and absolutely not enough on observation. And I would suggest that observation is the key thing that should be supported in the coming decade. So I will begin with a critical look at some global and regional temperature data. I think this, this is either from Jan Weitzer or Franz Singer. I stole this slide from. It's just to remind people, it's always very useful, what the recording of temperature at a station looks like. On the left, I don't know which station, but from 1850 to the year 2000, you have all the temperature data. And you see that actually the trend you're going to try to extract is the mean on the right. And when we talk about climate change in terms of temperature, what we're looking at is the figure on the right, which is always expanded on the vertical axis in such a way that you forget where it's extracted from. It doesn't mean it is not interesting or not meaningful. It means, one, you should remember how difficult it is to extract this small signal, and two, it doesn't have an error bar. Someone asked a question about uncertainties. Another one of my messages is that I believe uncertainties in many cases have been enormously underestimated, and we should always bear them in mind. So I will start with this first slide from the IPCC uh, 2007 report, which I'm sure you recognize. I would like you to focus not on the global curves, which I don't have time to deal with, but on two regional curves, the one for North America, the one for Europe. This is one of the diagrams, which I don't know about you, but when I first saw it, uh, I was very much a believer. I thought that this was clear evidence that the data shown by the black curves were better fit by models that included carbon dioxide increase in the past 30 or 40 years which is the range of pink models. It's a little bit like Nia, the, the question on uncertainties. It's like the domain of predictions that Nia had over the 21st century. This is from models from 12 different groups running with different parameters. So it's sort of an uncertainty band. In blue, without carbon dioxide, everything we think we know but carbon dioxide. In pink, you just add carbon dioxide and it works. It works on the edges of the uncertainties, but it seems to work and it's quite convincing. So the question, is this right? I won't go into any detail on the climate gate, but when we began working on this, we found that there were problems with these data. From the data centers, people average data in 500 degree, I'm sorry, 500 kilometer, five degree squares, and over an interval of time of one month. We all know that the spectrum of weather has a lot of energy in the few days to a few weeks scale. If the whole process is linear, Averaging over one month should not be a problem in looking at long-term trends, but if there is any non-linearity, if there is cascades of turbulence that lead from short time and space scales to large time and space scales, then the world data that everyone uses has lost that forever. So I wrote to Phil Jones five years ago, no idea who that guy was, and I said, can you give us your data? I believe there's a problem in treating them. I want to check it. Guess what the answer was? Well, sorry, we can't give them to you because we have all these secret agreements with countries and we cannot release them. I had no idea that all my emails to Phil Jones are in the climate gate files. And uh, actually, I can testify to the fact that they're right. The, re the result is that to this day, we have not been able to have access to the data. And I'm amazed that only three centers in the world, one in the UK, two in the US, none in Germany, none in France, none in Japan, none in Australia, I was thinking in my field of geophysics, there should be 20 groups checking, comparing, amassing the data. That's not the case. And a lot of people are using the data from the data center. Some of my numerical colleagues from the IPCC in France tell me, well, this is the data center. I take the data without discussing the data. Well, I've been brought up to discuss the data. And so we had no choice but try and do it over again, except that's the word 
of tens of people over decades. And we are a small group of five people with uh, no special funding and no student, because if I had a student on that subject, he would never get a job in these days. I'm not joking. This is a serious problem. So we are doing this with senior people, aging people who don't worry about their future like me. And uh, we've done it modestly for two continents. We've been able to redo Europe and North America. That's all. That's only a small part of the world. But it's giving us hints as to what can we think about the way the data are handled by the World Data Centers. And this is what we get from taking what we think are the best 44 European meteorological observatories that have data every day. We looked at minimum, maximum, range, and mean. I'm only showing one, but they're all showing the same thing. We average them because it means something. They're correlated. When you average temperature over the globe, I'm sure you're all familiar with the fact that temperature in thermodynamics being an extensive quantity, when you add temperatures, you get something mathematical, which is not a temperature and has no relationship either to enthalpy, entropy, energy, uh, or temperature. So the global temperature is not a temperature. It may be interesting, but it's not a temperature. At the regional scale, because it correlates, we get something we've all known for a long time. There is such a thing as regional climate. There is no such thing as world climate a priori. There might be, but it's not at all obvious. And when we do it for Europe with data every day, then we have to do some smoothing to see, because the signal has high variance. And again, the problem is extract the long-term uh, signal out of the variance. We find this curve for Europe. So this is the one that should apply to all those of you who are European and have ages that overlap the 20th century. Not at all what we expected. There are many ways in which you can find a track or a climate change in this figure. Clearly, temperatures at the beginning of the century are smaller than at the end. There is global, or I'm sorry, there is regional warming in Europe, but the shape of that warming is not at all what was expected by us, at least. If you remove all the data after 1986, you get an absolutely flat trend. There is zero warming between 1900 and 1986 in Europe. There is a sudden jump by almost one degree Celsius around 1886. And then we're back on a plateau where we are still standing. So why is that? In any case, models don't predict these jumps, don't predict these long trends, which are typical of a nonlinear system shifting in a chaotic or catastrophic way from one state to another state. And we believe that's the way to think about it. Then we do the same thing for the US. And for the US, we have 150 stations. The curve is completely different. The spectral content of the curve is the same, but the trend is clearly different. And actually, in the US, the temperature rise from 1910 to 1930 has the same value and slope as the recent global warming. All of it is lost between 1930 and 1970. And actually, this has had to be recognized by the US Weather Bureau. Uh, the hottest year of the century is not 1998, by a small amount, I agree. It's 1930. And of course, you find that neither of these two curves has any degree of correlation with the evolution of CO2. Maybe there's a reason why, but at least the correlation is invisible. And I can always average these two curves. But what does it mean? I have completely different trends. The one thing which is common, I have another regional climate, which for time scales of decades has fairly monotonous behavior, which changes abruptly in fairly short periods, not what the sinusoidal curves that we usually see tell us. And if I now compare our two curves to the two curves of the IPCC report at the same scale, you find that the black curve, which of course is a very rough subsampling, should be a subsampling of this curve and is very erroneous. It completely misses the very hot period that is in the 1930s. The European curve, well, if you take one data point every 10 years on that curve, you could get something like that. But you're completely erasing the fact that there is no change for 80 years and a sudden change at this time. And it is not the same time as in North America. Then if you compare the model, all right, the model which is supposed to be the best is the pink range. With your mind's eye, transpose the pink range on top of this curve, transpose the pink range here, Particularly for here, it does a very bad job. Conclusion, the figure one, or maybe this is figure two of the IPCC, is showing data that are more than uncertain. They are wrong in places. And the models which best fit the wrong data do not fit the right or the better data. So this is a really serious problem at the 100-year time scale. I want you to go back at a figure that I'm sure you all know very well. If you go to your website, the Met Office, 
and you look at the most recent curve of monthly. Remember, they're doing monthly values. Since the 1850s, you get the famous curve to which you would possibly want to fit the carbon dioxide curve, adding, as Nia showed you, the other things, aerosols and solar effects, as we think we know them, clearly too small, uh, volcanic eruptions, which are short-term effects. Well, do you get something like that? To me, now that I've seen, if that global curve has any meaning, which I'm not sure about, but I'm willing to go a little bit ahead with it, I think that it's much more displaying, with a lot of noise, these periods of fairly linear behavior separated by fairly, fairly fast changes. And I'm just showing you to, uh, this figure because you all know, and I think Nia's figures uh, were figures that ended around the year 2000. This ends in 2005 or 6, and you find what you know. From 1998 to this year, we have had 12 years of either plateau if you're conservative or slight decrease if you're ready to fit the data. All the maxima decrease, all the minima decrease, the mean value decreases, and I'm always showing people this figure to say how careful you have to be when you listen to someone, including me, but particularly when you listen to your weatherman repeating you, this is the fourth warmest year of the last 100 years or of the last decade. This is true. It's exactly the same thing as saying all these records are here because we have not yet gone down to a level that occurred in the previous 30 years. So temperature has been decreasing for 12 years. And global temperature rise has stopped for 12 years. Might start again, but it has stopped. And none of the models predict that. Is equally true as saying all of the temperature records are in the last 10 years. Except when you hear the latter, you think it's still warming, which it is not. And you get an impression which is wrong. If you go to the 1,000-year time scale, I'm not going to spend much time. I'm pretty sure here that 99.9% uh, .9 of the people, which are, if I round it up means everyone, uh, uh, is uh, aware of the fact that the man curve does not hold anymore, that it's understood why, that it is due to an effect of uh, trees, uh, because trees are living things. They have a, a physiology. They adapt to the long term. Hence, in terms of time series analysis, in my jargon, they are high-pass filters. The tree rings record very well the quick changes in temperature and precipitation. They don't record well the long term. And as Moberg has shown in Nature in 2007, for the long term, it's better to use oxygen isotopes on sediments. And if you blend the two, you recover the medieval climatic optimum and the ice age, which people in Europe have known about, historians, geographers, for a long time, which is still a matter of debate. It is hotly debated whether the medieval climatic optimum was real. Some IPCC people think it was not. They think the Vikings cheated by saying Greenland was green to attract people, but actually it was lousy weather and they were just trying to attract these people there. I mean, this is seriously being defended by some colleagues, and I don't know, maybe they're right. So to be honest, as honest as I can all the time, this is a matter of debate, but the more I read, the more it seems to me that there's no doubt about the Little Ice Age, very little doubt about the medieval climatic optimum, and some more and more data near showed them on a longer time scale, showing that there was a Roman optimum and probably a new optimum at 1000 before Christ. So we are beginning to see this quasi-periodicity of solar behavior. It can only be attributed to the sun with something like a 1,000. I think Fred would like 1,500. And since it's a non-periodical ph phenomenon, it does not have to be a constant period. But it does show that the present period is neither significantly warmer nor rising significantly faster than at previous times in the past history. Now, people often say it's warmer than in the past 800 years. Well, of course, if you cut the diagram before the optimum, you can say it's the warmest since. But I think that. At least based on that data, you cannot say that. And there's this very interesting paper by Grad in 2008 that I don't have time to go into, who uh, goes into a lot of detail to show that rather than using the uh, thickness of the tree rings, you should use wood density because the response function of wood density is flatter and has less bias. And he compares his previous curve in red when he was not taking that into account very honestly with what is corrected and it becomes the blue curve. You find that until 1900, his curves have not changed. But in the past 100 years, a lot of the apparent temperature rise obtained from tree rings is due to the bias of the fact that there are too many young trees in the data collection he uses. Now, this is a regional curve for northern Europe. It is not global. But I think it's one more bit of information that tells us that actually temperature in the 20th century 
in Europe at least, is not exceptional. It has been encountered five times in the past 1,500 years, and in the medieval climatic optimum for something like two centuries, it was likely more than today, which is more uh, uh, radical than what uh, Mo Moberg was saying. Moberg still had the present-day temperatures larger, at least for Europe, Grud has the uh, present-day temperatures less than in the climatic optimum. I would say statistically, we're in the same ballpark, and we don't have data that tell us that something exceptional, unnatural, is going on. Second part of my talk, which will be very complementary to Nir Shaviv's, is our work. What have been we doing? We have been making a hypothesis, which is we're seeing more and more data that show us a solar effect which has not been identified before. I, th I agree with Nir that there's a lot of evidence, but we believe that this evidence is still not completely uncontroversial. I think that we need more and more, and we have been amassing through eight papers, eight bits of, in of solar evidence, three of which I'm going to show you here, briefly. Uh, solar activity, as you know, is followed in a number of ways. The easiest proxy is to use sunspots uh, since the time of their discovery by Galileo the Maunder minimum with no sunspots. What I want to point out is that in addition to the 11-year uh, or quasi-11-year solar cycle and the 22-year magnetic cycle, which we should not forget, there are things which are not cycles because this is not a periodical phenomenon. It's a convective, it's the solar dynamo convecting in a turbulent way. If you look at the envelope, it has a shape that has that general increase that Nia showed you, which is uh, equivalent to watts per square meter in terms of change of uh, the budget of uh, the thermal budget. But what I want to concentrate on is particularly the changes in that envelope, which is a multi decennial or decadal uh, variation, which has this very characteristic shape of a big M with a skewed shape. I have to go very fast or I'll be too long and I'll bore you, so I'll just comment on the lower right-hand side of this slide. We have measured here something we call the variability of a signal. So we're looking at a signal and we're measuring the speed at which it changes as it changes with time. And when we do that with solar activity, we get the blue curve. So what, and, and for those of you who are too far to read, this is the 20th century from 1900 to the year 2000. So the blue curve, knows only the sun. And you do find this skewed capital M of solar activity over the 20th century, which was shown in red in a much rougher way. This is the real shape in blue. And in green, you have the variability of temperatures of all Netherlands temperature stations. So the green curves knows only the temperature of the Netherlands. The red one on the left is for Europe. The reason we have the right one is that when we take all stations in Europe, a number of them have not reported their latest results, and we cannot document the, low, the, the most recent part. So when we did this, we thought, uh oh are we going to see a big change with the red curve going up and the blue curve going down, and that's where something is happening? Well, not at all. The variability of temperatures is following the recent decline of solar activity. And you don't need to calculate a correlation coefficient to believe in that. I mean, as Nia was saying, it's very important when you see two very well correlated curves, to, not to say right away there's a causal connection, because that can be a common driving factor to the two. But what I'm amazed to see is that lots of people saying the right sentence, beware of correlation, correlation is not causality, their conclusion is forget it. I mean, it's a fabulous piece of information, and seeing that kind of correlation is, to us, with 40 years' experience of looking at data, absolutely telling. Second example, most recent, not yet published. No need to tell you, it's very hard to publish these things. We get rejected most of the time. Uh, we've been looking at the so-called Madden-Julian oscillation. Uh, I didn't know about that oscillation until three, four years ago, so I don't know how many of you are climate specialists. We all know about El Nino and La Nina, which are oscillations of the Pacific uh, climate system. Uh, actually, uh, uh, the Madden Julian is another one, uh, which is in the northern Pacific, basically evaporation in the Philippines and eastern Pacific Ocean being taken by uh, winds blowing to the east, uh, over the Pacific and rain falling from the dayline date to uh, California and Oregon. This phenomenon is known to have a noise response. The spectrum has a peak around 40 to 30 days. And so what we have been following is the peak of the spectral activity of the Madden-Julian oscillation. There are many indices of the Madden-Julian oscillation, like pressure in Kamchatka minus pressure in Hawaii. You know, these, they have 12 
MJO indices. You can take any one of them. We took one, we took another, we averaged them, and we just superimposed them on the solar cycle on the top part and on the variability of the magnetic field, which is my specialty, which is entirely driven by the sun in an indirect way, a little bit like the cosmic rays that uh, Nia talked about. Both of these correlations are quite good. Hence, there is a control of the key frequency of the major oceanic oscillation that pulsates with the solar cycle. The most recent publication we have, which to me as a solid earth geophysicist is the most convincing, is the length of the day. We've been extracting the strongest component of change of the length of the day. You, I, I suppose most of you know that the Earth rotates about itself in one day, which is about 86,400 seconds, plus or minus a few milliseconds, because the Earth is a deformable body. And as you know from the denser rotating, if you change the moment, the, the moment of inertia, or if you change the motion of one part, you must keep the angular momentum constant. We've been analyzing that six-month line of the length of day, which is measured in milliseconds, and it has this shape. Uh, we'll not look at the phase from which we have not extracted any useful information, but the phase, if you look at the solar cycle, again, this is the same blue curve, and this is sunspot reversed in sign and offset by one year. Why should we reverse it by, one, uh, uh, by sign and offset it by one year? Well, we have to remember this is the correlation between cosmic rays and solar activity, total, sol total, total solar irradiance, or uh, sunspot numbers. And actually, the lower curve is the direct measure of cosmic rays at some station. And you find that, indeed, there's very good correlation. How could cosmic rays do something to the rotation of the solid Earth? Well, the answer is uh, simply uh, that as the solid Earth goes faster, what has to go the other way to maintain the angular momentum constant? It is the atmosphere. And so what we're looking at here at this period is the integral, the sum total of all of the winds of the troposphere and lower stratosphere going along circles of constant latitude, along parallels. So we are actually seeing that cosmic rays, solar activity, modulates for 40 years the integral of all the winds of the world system. So how can you say after that that there is no influence of the sun on some key parameters? I've shown you temperature, temperature variability, a typical oceanic oscillation, and the Earth's rotation through the system of winds. So these are all. And that takes us to forcing factors. And uh, uh, this is the typical figure which all of us are showing our students uh, to show how the heat from the sun, which is actually 342 watts per square meter. I think it's pretty, for once, it's a, it's a parameter that's easy to figure out. Everyone here, except maybe the Americans and the British, know what a square meter is. Uh, and, uh, and everyone was, knows what an electric bulb with 100 watts is like. So that's three bulbs per square meter. That's how much uh, uh, sunlight or total solar irradiance comes at the top of the atmosphere. Many things happen to it. Some of it, and that's my key point, is reflected by the top of the clouds as much as one quarter of the total. So we're talking about something like 80 watts per square meter being reflected. Some is absorbed, some is absorbed by the Earth, re-emitted as infrared, absorbed by clouds, re-emitted upside uh, up and down. This is the greenhouse effect. And basically, it's the change in that effect due to the increase in carbon dioxide con uh, concentration, which, as Nia said, is supposed by the IPCC people to amount, if there is doubling, which is not yet reached, to 3.7, 3.8 watts per square meter. So this is the order of magnitude. This is why the one watt per square meter that he talked about is so important. Well, my remark is that, and I don't have to repeat that, through the forcing factor which is a hypothesis. There was a question about what is the cloud experiment about. Well, we cannot say we have demonstrated that cosmic rays are responsible, but we have shown that it is an excellent, very serious, worth working about hypothesis. So IPCC people cannot tell us forget about cosmic rays, but we cannot say we have shown that it is cosmic rays. It's a working project with very much probability and very promising views. And what I wanted to say, which you've been reading while I was speaking, is that you saw, well, actually, this is the same curve that Nia showed about the correlation between low cloud cover from 80, 1980 to 2005 and cosmic rays. You see that the low cloud amount has changed by a couple of percent. 
No one has any idea prior to satellites and some of these stations as to how much the Earth's global cloud cover has changed in 100 years. If it has changed by 10 percent, by that would mean 8 watts per square meter. Well, here it's been 2 or 3 percent. Why not 10 percent? I don't know. I'm just saying this is an order of magnitude which is not ridiculous. And 8 watts per square meter compared to 3.8 is clearly something that is important. Yet, clouds, cosmic rays, and these things are not in any of the models proposed by IPCC. Conclusion, their models are doing what they can. But when they say that, what they are predicting is 90 percent sure. This is not reasonable. There is too much here to say you are missing significant parts, and there's no shame. This is ongoing research, and why should you have understood all? I would like to point out another series of papers besides all of the Bright, Svensmark, and Alt papers by the, uh, Professor Tinsley and his colleagues, who has another idea, which I think is not exclusive. His idea is that, as we know, there is 250 kilovolts between the ionosphere 100 kilometers above our heads and the surface where we are standing. And as that atmosphere is not, as I had thought before, an insulator, we're not looking at a perfect condenser, we're looking at something that is leaking. And what is leaking is a continuous vertical electrical current, which they call JZ, J for current, Z for vertical component, which is on the order of one to four picowatts per square meter. This is very small, yet it is absolutely sufficient to charge the top of the clouds positively and the base of the clouds negatively, hence change the electric field in the clouds. Hence, we come back to what Nir Shaviv said, the microphysics of clouds. Whether it be cosmic rays, ionization, nucleation, or the electric field, but the one thing we know is that electrical currents in the ionosphere vary over a solar cycle by 10 to 20 percent because what is important is not the change in total solar irradiance, it's the change in UV and extreme UV. They are small, but they vary enormously. And that is one of the amplifying factors. You go from one per mil change in TSI, total solar variance, to 10% for UV and more than 10% for EUV. So we know that electric field changes by tens of percent. So if that changes by tens of percent, all our orders of magnitude are reasonable. We are coming to watts per square meter on the order of one to a few watts per square meter, completely missing from any current IPCC model. So my conclusion come in a few slides, and some will be repetition with my previous introduction. I've talked about the golden triangle, which I think should be balanced back to more on observation and more on physical mechanisms as preferred to numerical modeling, of which I believe we have enough. And I think that actually the present increase in computer memory quality, 3D color images, leads people more and more to believe that what comes out of a program is reality, and that's very dangerous. Uh, Another thing I have not said is that we all know since Kuhn and Popper that in order to be acceptable for physicists, a model must be falsifiable. There must be ways to show it's wrong. And actually, what strikes me with the IPCC or GCMs, you tell them something is wrong, they Twitter a parameter, and it's OK. So whatever you do to it, it comes back. What does it mean? Maybe it's right, but it's not falsifiable. Hence, it's not scientific. Uh, the importance of uncertainties, enormous underestimation of uncertainties of what we have to acknowledge we don't know. Is there global warming? Another thing is, as may have happened to many of you, when I say some of what I tell you, of course I get attacked bitterly, and people say he does not believe in global warming. There is the mixing between questions. Global warming, cause of global warming. Okay? I do believe there is global warming on the few cases we checked, but you saw how different it is from the data from the World Center, and how different it is from one region to the other, from, from one time to the other. Hence, uh, I think this irregularity is not modeled properly. It is not without precedent in value or speed in the past thousands of years. And uh, uh, the last line is self-obvious. The importance of solar activity I've been arguing about. I want to insist that we have shown numerically that the modulation effect we find are up to 30%. So we're not looking at small phenomena. And the mechanisms you also have heard about the last line. And maybe for our discussion, and this is what I touched a little bit in my introduction, I think that there's problems with the consensus. And I think that there's a great risk that if we are, if, if what I've been telling you happens to be shown right, and I tend to think we need another 10 years, 
someone has said five years to 10 years of data to really tell with uncertainties whether the IPCC models can be discarded finally or not. And I think we'll have the answer soon. And I think yeah, I forgot to mention the very important work by uh, the Jaeger and Duho solar physicists who have shown that the sun jumps from one state to the other. Again, a nonlinear model jumping from one state to the other. They've shown that uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago, we jumped from the highest state to possibly the lowest state, as low as the one that was prevalent in the mode of minimum. If we dare to predict, we should predict that that slow slope that we've seen for the past 12 years is going to continue for another couple of decades, because 30 years, this V shape, this zigzag shape, is typically undulations clearly linked to solar activity, not to uh, another uh, source. And then the, the rest is politics. I said we have to be very careful not to mix them. So I remove my scientist hat. I put my citizen's hat in saying, I'm amazed that people are spending so much effort and money on something which is fascinating but so uncertain when there are clearly certain problems. Uh, drinking water. It's demonstrated today that we are missing drinking water in many continents around the world. And it will be maybe the cause of some of the wars of the 21st century, as oil was in the 20th century. Management of urban waste. We're going to a few more billion people, 60% in urban areas. We don't know how to manage waste. We are sure there will be a problem. And hunger in the world, 1 billion people are under the poverty level and uh, hunger. So if someone wants to spend money on good causes that are not 90% but 100% sure. There's a large number of it. And it's an amazing thing to me that some of our, uh, well, most until recently of our heads of state, who are not supposed to be the most stupid people, were all running to Copenhagen rather than solving with a balanced way these other questions. And because I have to advertise my own house, I should say I'm against frightening people. I think anxiety is not the way to work. I don't think we need to be anxious. I, I can be as bold as saying if the world does heat by two degrees, which would contradict what I've said, I think there will be no problem, by the way. Uh, but uh, in case we're right, it's going to be cooling. And uh, well, no comment on the temperature outside today. But what I want to say is that we should be funding research. There's ample room for that. We should be training young people. We should not scare them. We should tell them there are problems which they will be able to attack. And geoscientists will be able to address some of these problems. Thank you.